Cody Bellinger has finally signed, and we're going to go over whether or not the Mariners could have gotten Bellinger on the contract he got with the Cubs. We're also going to talk about some of our early spring training standouts. We're just two games in, but there have been some things we've noticed, and then we're finally going to end up at depth with the Mariners, what they've done throughout this offseason, as well as a new minor league signing that they have. Welcome to episode 64 of the Hit It Here podcast, part of the Believe Network, the Gene Machi episode of the Hit It Here podcast. I'm here with Joe. Joe, how are you? Mean Gene Machi, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. I'm doing great. Yep. Had a return to stream earlier today, which was exciting. You know, three weeks off, but we're back, back, yep. like we're back Second like bite. the Mariners. Okay. You ha- don't even start with me. We say hi to you at least two or three times a stream to your black screen on the layout. Okay. We say hi to you and you look great every single time. So Cody Bellinger, three years, $80 million. Some weird opt-outs in there. And, you know, if Scott Boris was, like, just waiting, just holding his hands close to his chest, waiting for teams to, you know, come to them, come to, like, him and his players, hat in hand, Kevin Mather style, as you would like to usually make that connection there, the Cubs just made sense for Ballinger. And I, with the money, like, sure, should the Mariners have done three years, 80 million? Like, or could they have, if even with the opt-outs, it's, literally could just be a one-year $30 million contract. Is that worth it at in the long run for this team? Maybe because it's just one year, so the money really doesn't matter in the long run because you're done after 2024, and if Cody Bulger doesn't work, so be it. You're just moving on. But the thing that I have trouble, I think, coming to terms with is just I don't think even with that same number, he's not coming to Seattle. Like I would be willing to place a bet on it. And I do it on BetOnline, so a quick word from BetOnline. The MLB season is approaching soon. Spring training's here. If you want to play some bets on it, you can do it with BetOnline. But until then, BetOnline continues to be your number one source for all your basketball wagering needs, including pro and college hoops throughout the year. It's currently the end of February, which means one of the biggest tournaments, I think, in the United States. March Madness, the NCAA tournament, college basketball, is right around the corner. Bet online is going to be your place to be if you would like to make any sort of betting arrangement for March Madness. With up-to-the-minute odds, stats, and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in-game live betting contests and all the best player props. The NBA season's coming to an end here soon. Teams are in the playoff push. Those guys are going to be wanting to put up numbers. You can place your bets on your favorite players for those teams. Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime from your desktop or your mobile device. Head to Bet Online today to become part of the team and remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, for your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, the game starts here. But Colton, I know you've talked at large, <laughs> fitting, that one year contracts for any of these free agents could be the top of the you know, free agent class, or even the bottom of the barrel, they don't really affect you long-term. So like this three-year 80 million with the opt-outs for Bellinger, what what do you make of it in regards to even if the Mariners had a chance? Yeah, I mean, if the Mariners had offered that to Bellinger, he says no. The reason that he's going to the Cubs is because he knows the Cubs. It's a ballpark he knows that he can hit in, and it's a team that he knows well. The Mariners never would have stood a chance if they had offered him that same contract. It's just the way that it is. Don't get me wrong. Would I have loved Bellinger on this deal? Sure. I think that a, a one-year $30 million deal for Bellinger, if I'm, a, if I'm the Mariners, I'm fine with that because of the positional versatility that he gives you where if Ty France struggles, okay, you can put Bellinger in center field if you need to. He is basically... Bellinger is basically a more expensive but also better version of Luke Rayleigh mm-hmm. in terms of positional versatility, in my opinion. Um, and I think that... Eh, he, I, he just wouldn't have accepted it with the Mariners. If I was Jerry Depoto and Justin Hollander, yes, I would have offered this to him 10 times out of 10. But originally it was expected he was going to get, what, like a 12-year, no. $256 million contract? People were memeing that, like, original yeah. prediction from Trade Rumors all day after, I mean, it was, what, like 11 o'clock last night when the passing bomb dropped? You tweeted something out early, I think early this morning, that, oh. no, not the inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> um about how like you, you it, it put in the tweet about how Bellinger will be playing center field for the Cubs. And I thought that was interesting because where does that put them with like Pete Crow Armstrong for you? Like is is Bellinger going to a corner? Is like he going to a corner? Like or is Bellinger playing first? Like 
I understand like where your heart was with that because obviously we have Julio. So Bellinger was never going to be in center. He was going to be in a corner or at first base. Does that affect that? I mean, how much do you think that affected Bellinger's decision of like, okay, the Cubs, they want me in center field or they want me at first base. Like there was really no one really competing for him at those positions necessarily. Like sure. PCA is going to be great, but like you're probably still putting Bellinger out there now. And then Pete Karamstrong like a year or two. Yeah, I'm not sure when PCA comes up and, you know, is an everyday fixture in that lineup. And I think that Bellinger, I mean, is a gold glove caliber outfielder. Mm -hmm. He is. And I think that giving him an everyday spot, because don't get me wrong, if he had signed with the Mariners, he would have played every day. They would have found a way, whether that be moving him around the outfield, putting him at first base or even DHing. He would have played basically every single day. But it's just with with the signing of Mitch Garver, obviously limits Mitch Garber can only play can only DH so let's just say for a moment that Bellinger would have accepted this deal with the Mariners he's limited now because Julio's your everyday center fielder you're not going to move him off of center field for Cody Bellinger both of them are both very good defensively as for right field you have Mitch Hanniger again now you can't necessarily move Mitch to DH because now you have Mitch Garver so you either say oh sorry Mitch, you're not playing every day, or you're not playing as much as you want to be playing. Same thing with Luke Rayleigh. Like, ooh, sorry, you know, you're not going to be in there every single day. So just just in terms of the way that this team is constructed, without a corresponding move, moving one of the outfielders or Ty France, the deal just doesn't make sense to me if you're the Seattle Mariners. Again, I would have loved to have Bellinger on the books for 2024. He probably would have opted out after 2024, I'd assume, to yeah. test the free agent market again next year. But this is just, you know... We are already a couple weeks into spring training now, and this is kind of just where the market fell. Did I think that Bellinger was going to get less than, you know, nine figures? No, absolutely not. But, you know, here we are on February 25th, and Cody Bellinger signed for $80 million. We've talked a lot about Cody Bellinger, and, you know, it's a fleeting thought at this point because, well, we can't sign him anymore. But another free agent that has been talked about, I think, numerous times with the Seattle Mariners it's Matt Chapman. And with this contract, does this kind of shape Chapman's market a little bit? Maybe. But I still don't know how it really fits for the Seattle Mariners. And I think if they know something more that they really haven't told us, maybe about Luis Arias' shoulder, if it's you know a little bit more concerning than we were originally led to believe, because we haven't seen him in any action yet, which I think makes sense. Maybe in a DH role we could have seen him, but through two games, haven't seen him. So that's the one area, I think, where if we find out more about Luis Urias, Matt Chapman could make sense. This contract, though, it's like the only way it makes sense, I think, in the long run is that it's another like opt-out style deal that Bellinger signed with the Cubs. Like That just seems like the avenue that Boris is going to have to take to try and get his guys signed or get teams to spend a little bit more on his free agents. So for like Chapman, it's like what one like a two year deal with an opt out after one. You're sitting at like what fifteen million, sixteen million AAV maybe. Like, do you have to go higher than that to get him? I don't think so. I honestly think that Chapman's market has fallen on its own, even without the Bellinger contract. I think the Bellinger contract just solidifies more that Matt Chapman is going to have to take a deal like you just said mm-hmm. because he. I don't remember who it was. I think it was CBS or something. It was reporting like a five-year 150 or something like that. I'm like, no, God, I think no. it was six 150. Yeah. Was it six 150? Either way, I'm like, yeah, no, way like, too no much. Shot. And yeah, I think 15. I mean, I know that we had talked before about, you know, uh, 12, 12 million a year. Uh, I think that if you were to do a two-year deal, 15 million a, uh, a year with an opt-out after the first year, I'm fine with that. I think that, like you said, if you hear more about Luis Arias, which I actually want to get to more about that in just a second, but if you hear more about Luis Arias and say, let's say he has to have surgery or something, and he's going to be out for most of the year, then you need to pivot because I like Josh Rojas. I do, but I don't think that you want him. It goes back to having him as an everyday second baseman. You're in a better spot now because I'd rather have Rojas and Polanco holding down everyday spots instead of Rojas and Arias. Mm-hmm. But overall, I think that because of the Bellinger contract, we will. I just Matt Chapman is not going to happen. He's not going to come here because yeah. he's going to get that contract somewhere else. Like I, 
I keep telling myself that he makes sense for the Mariners. I try, I'm trying to convince myself that he makes sense for the Mariners, which I don't think he does. But he, if he gets offered that contract, he's going to take it somewhere else. Like, like the and I don't know. The Blue Jays. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. And I think that one of those teams is going to reach out and give him that contract. And all things, if all things are the same, let's say the Mariners, Giants, Blue Jays all offer him that contract, he's probably just going to go back to the Blue Jays like Bellinger went back to the Cubs. Mm-hmm. So I know that when, I, when you and I first talked about this episode, we laid this out differently, but I want to talk about depth next because it just goes along with what we're talking about. So going along with the Luis Urias injury, the Mariners have signed a lot of depth pieces for the infield, including recently Robbie Tenorowicz. Sure. Robbie T, you crushed it, bro. The Birdman. That's all that. <laughs> Give him the nickname Robbie T. It's great. It's got a great Robbie mustache. T. Good flow. Was in Arkansas mm. last year. Infield positional depth guy. He was also in Tacoma. Oh, did he make it all the way to Tacoma at the end of the oh, year? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me let me let me read you some stats here off the old cellular device here. Lay it on. So, me. in um, Arkansas, in eighty-seven games, he hit two ninety-one, four hundred eight, five hundred six. With 16 home runs and 80 RBI, 44 walks to 65 strikeouts. Not bad. Mm-hmm. Um, with the Rainiers, he played in 47 games. He yeah. hit uh, 264, 358, 351. So not a whole lot of power for Tenor Wicks there. Um, and he hit three home runs, 21 RBIs, 18 walks to 34 stolen bags. So stolen obviously a bags. bit of a fall off. I'm sorry. Strikeouts. I was like, my goodness. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I didn't know the flow could so, move that fast. Robbie T, all right, he could play second base, first base, and third base. So by signing, re-signing him, by having Michael Chavis, by signing Nick Solak, the Mariners are giving themselves options in the infield right now should something happen, like a Luis Urias injury that keeps him out for most of the year. I think that that's important to do because we all know that the weak spot for the Mariners is probably third base. Like, mm-hmm. that's just... When you look around this this 26-man roster, third base is probably the biggest glaring hole. That could obviously change due to injuries or what have you. But if, let's say, you do have to have somebody like, I don't know, Michael Chavis come up or Nick Solak come up, maybe you switch Jorge Polanco to third base and have them both play second base, with Rojas and you know Chavis or what have you, just depending on you know how you feel about these guys down in AAA. The point is, the Mariners have created more depth at the minor league levels than we have seen in recent years because before I'm trying to think of who has had to come up and just like randomly make a start. Do you have anyone in mind? Like, I mean, Caballero was like forced up really quickly who right. I think performed well enough. A guy that last year did not ever get the call, but was hitting well in Tacoma was Jake Shiner mm-hmm. a guy that, you know, people were pounding the table for a decent amount the same way they were doing for Mike Ford at the beginning of last year. So There have been options in the Mariners minor league system. I think whether or not they'd be as impactful this year as say like Mike Ford coming up last year or even Caballero, like, yes, like a lot of Caballero's value came from his base running and his defense, but it's value nonetheless. Like, would you take Michael Chavis's bat over Caballero's? Maybe, you know, it's not a guarantee, but I I get where you're going with having that depth. So like around the infield, it's not like it just one spot too. like those guys are pretty like versatile in that way might not be like great versatility, but it's there. Nonetheless, a guy that you did not say who I think is probably at the top of the list. He just hasn't made any mod Taylor. No, not, we're not at their standouts yet. A guy that has not made an appearance in spring training is Brian Anderson Mm, signed to a minor league deal. gets $2 million. If he makes the major league team had a great, April and March for the Brewers last year. And then his spot just kind of his playing time just kind of got sapped, like just slowly trickled off, did not continue. And then he was released towards the end of the year last year, but put up like a slash on like 250. Uh, he had like a, Oh, I, I read it on stream. I can't remember, but he was batting like 250 hit like five homers, drove in 20 RBI, like solid enough numbers at third base to, maybe not have to play every day within the Mariners organization of like how the lineup is constructed and how the roster is constructed. Whereas for the Brewers, he was playing every day, but Anderson is a guy that I think if Urias sees extended time off or just doesn't have it where like how we wanted him to and Anderson's playing well, I could see him making it over 
Luis Arias pretty soundly. And, like, not to, like, rag on Chavis or Solak or anything, but, like, we had Nick Solak last spring training, and we released him. Like, he was not even part of the organization after spring training, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. Was it Solak or Senzel? I get them both mixed it up was, a lot. It was Solak. We never had Senzel, I don't think. Okay. Oh, I could be so wrong. I think it was Nick Solak. If not, it's my head. So, I under, like, the depth is good, and it's... It's, I don't know. We talked about it a little bit at the beginning of stream. Or stream. Lord, I'm doing what you're doing. We talked a little bit about it at the beginning before we started recording of like, it's depth that they have, whether or not it's good, put air quotes around it. It doesn't matter necessarily because it's depth that you didn't have regard, like otherwise. Like these are guys that have played at the major league level, had some minor successes here and there, who if they find a bit of resurgence, so be it. Like that's great that we have the op like we have the option. As opposed to now we're relying on, say, like Ryan Bliss, who has never made any major league appearances. Like, sure, could you trust Ryan Bliss over Michael Chavis? Maybe. But, like, it, now you don't have to pick one or the other. Like, or, it, you're not limited to just one. It's mm -hmm. kind of your point. And I think that I've never seen, and I could be wrong here, but I've never seen the Mariners sign so many extra depth pieces for the infield specifically. Like, we've seen them go out and get, you know, a few outfielders here or there. Every spring, of course, we see them go out and get a bunch of pitchers. But the infield specifically, right-handed hitting guys that can play second and third base. Mm -hmm. Like, there's very clearly, there, there's a clear plan in place here that there, we're going to probably see these guys a lot this spring. Like, I think that we will see Chavis, Samad Taylor, Brian Anderson once he's there and ready to go, um, Senza, or Solak God. Uh, etc. I think we're going to see them a lot this spring so they can figure out who is sticking around because obviously not all of these guys are going to be are going to stick on the 40 man or even in in on a minor league contract. A lot of these guys will probably be free agents by the end of spring training. It's just, you know, roster crunch wise and I mean, there's not that many spots down in AAA. We know Ryan Bliss is going to be the starting second baseman down there. Robbie Tenorwick is going to be somewhere in that infield more than likely. Brian Anderson, if he sticks, I I feel like if Brian Anderson doesn't make the team, he can probably opt to become a free agent. Probably. So I think that's probably what will happen. But the Mariners are they they're going at this with a plan, and I think that that plan is really contingent on what happens with Luis Urias the rest of the way. And let's say you know someone else gets hurt, they have the guys to now fill in for them, which is something that last year, like when Ty France got hurt, Dylan Moore and Sam Haggerty played first base. Ideally, you don't see that in 2024 because they have all these other depth guys. I'm not saying they're better than Dylan Moore or Sam Haggerty, but just giving yourselves more options to see what sticks, that's important for the Mariners. And one guy that I've been really impressed with so far has been Samad Taylor. Obviously, first home run of the spring uh, for the Mariners in the first game. He's played in both games so far this spring. I don't, I didn't get to watch much of today's game. Did he do anything today? Not like necessarily it was a lot of there's a lot of free swinging i'll say that mm -hmm. in the majority of today's game that leads me to believe that i mean it's early it's early in spring like i'm not going to read into ryan bliss taking dad hacks on three straight pitches that he probably shouldn't have swung at like he struck out in his both of his at bats but like samad taylor had a great game in the first game you know immediately got pit like subbed in for jorge polanco and stole second base immediately um, then obviously hit that home run. Didn't Smod Taylor fly out to the warning track twice today? Maybe. I don't know. I know he did at least once. Sure. I Again, it was a... Uh, I was half watching the game because I fell asleep during part of it. But... It was, uh, it was, it was, you guys a, see what I deal with? There was a long inning there from uh, Kirby Sneed and then an even longer mm -hmm. one there from Holden Laws a bit later. Two guys who probably won't be making the team after those appearances. So standout guys, you're talking Samad Taylor, bringing good energy, bringing good vibes, like just like going out there and like, I think just giving it his all. Like he's looked better than Sam Haggerty, like very easily in my opinion. Like I would not be surprised if he's our, like if there's, you know, it's a three horse race for like the utility guy for the Mariners in the major leagues. Like Dylan Moore's probably still in front just because like pedigree. Samad Taylor has passed Sam Haggerty in that way. Other guys like Jackson Kowar looked good in his one inning that he did in the first game against the White Sox. I hope we see a bit more of him 
Jonathan Diaz honestly started the game, game two, two innings, four Ks. You look pre- good. Pretty good. Like, you know, it's it's depth in like a spot start situation or like a long relief option for you. He'll be down in Tacoma if he sticks. So it's just, you know, you're talking about going back to the previous point, like depth. Like some so far, a lot of the guys look like they are gonna be providing a good level of depth. Is there is there someone else other than say like Samad Taylor for the Mariners like on the offensive side that you think has been like like standing out? I mean, it's hard not to say Mitch Haniger. Mm-hmm. You know, it was so cool to like. So I I was at work. Shh, don't tell my manager. And I had the game propped up next to me while I'm like doing stuff, and I'm like, oh. And I saw Mitch come up, and then like I had to do something really quick, and I look up and I see the outfielder running back, and I'm mm-hmm. like, no shot, no way. And there it went. And I saw him round in third getting a standing ovation. That was so cool. It was I'm so, so happy to have him back. Yeah, it was a, it was a very cool moment just to like just to witness. Like, I, I can only imagine being there, like being part of that situation. Like, sure, it's spring training game number two. It's his first at bat back in a Mariners uniform. It's just it, it's just a powerful moment. It's just really cool. And I think that if if Mitch is healthy this year, I mean looked good yeah i i don't i don't think we'll see him for a few days i think they're gonna slow play him along with cal they're gonna slow play a lot of the starters here at the beginning of spring training especially i would assume the guys that have injury concern like mitch so if mitch hanniger can stay healthy i think that he can not he's not gonna be 2021 mitch if he is by golly we're winning the, we're winning the whole damn thing mm-hmm. but it, if he can be half of what he was in 2021 the mariners have that, I mean, that's an upgrade, in my opinion, over Tay Oscar last year. If he can be half of what he was in 2021. Sorry, Tay Oscar. Love you, love you to death, but it's true. Dominic Canzone. Nah, obviously, he's looking beefy now. Yeah. And he hit a, he had almost hit a home run. It went off the wall, I think, right? Yeah. Double off the wall. It yeah, on, he looked good. It was off a lefty, though. Like, yeah. And it was on a breaking thing, yeah. pitch. Oh, I didn't. Was it on a breaking pitch as well? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. See, I didn't see that. Okay. Yeah. So, I don't know. He he's changed up his stance a little bit. He's yeah. not so like compact and down. Mm-hmm. Was he and always I, lifting his front foot? Like was he always on like his toes? I believe so. Okay. Um, it just looks what, a little one, awkward when he's like more upright. One thing he was talking about in the interview um shortly thereafter was he was saying that a lot of spring training so far has been making sure that he gets his leg kick uh down and like cuz I think m- maybe he was the timing was off on mm-hmm. his leg kick last year. I don't know. But it sounded like he talked about that multiple times in his interview um, on the broadcast. So I think that with his new batting stance, maybe he's able to get his foot down quicker. I I don't know. I'm not. I I am no me- mechanic magician. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Of course not. Right. Yeah. You're not I'm, a drive not. line. You don't know about things like that, like swing mechanics. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, Mitch and Dominic Canzone, two guys that in my earlier in the offseason I said should probably be platooning in right field i'm very excited to see you know what they look like throughout the rest of spring training i've also been again impressed with the young guys i know harry ford threw a runner out earlier um Mm -hmm. in today's game uh again i didn't get to watch a whole lot of today's game unfortunately but i don't know i like what i'm seeing out of a lot of these young guys for just again depth for the mariners but also kind of what the future looks like for this team yeah a guy that i was very passionate about throwing into my trade packages Jonathan Class A has actually looked pretty decent. Like, reaction time's not great out there defensively, but his speed is enough to make up for it. You know what he can do on the base paths with his speed. That's a guy that, like, could be the sneaky addition, like, in the second half, where he's just the nuisance on the base paths that's now causing havoc for other teams and being a spark plug for your team. The hit tool, it's not perfect, but, you know, if he can slap the ball around. Like, Billy Hamilton made a career out of being fast. Jonathan Class A can easily do the same thing. I immediately thought of Taron score from the pitching side of things. You did mention Jonathan Diaz. He's looked really, really good. We haven't seen a whole lot of other like guys that are probably going to be on the major league roster. I know that I think Cody Bolton pitched today, didn't he? Yeah. His breaking pitches looked good, but I mean, I would say less than Jackson Kowar at this point. Yeah. So, so if we're like projecting those final couple of spots in the bullpen, are you, are you putting Kowar in there after, you know, one appearance, <laughs> the one inning him? Yeah. I mean, Jovera looked fine in the first game as mm-hmm. well. So, I mean, they just seem like they have the most major league, I think pedigree. So that just like kind of lends me to say like them so far, but it is a long spring. We've got what 
however many more games, like what, like 20 plus games, like there's going to be so much more time for guys to either get hit around or strike out the side and mm -hmm. wow everybody at home. It's spring training. Like you don't have to focus on the negatives a ton. Like you can take them with a grain of salt of like, okay, Ryan Bliss is literally swinging for the fences every single at bat. Does he make adjustments? That's what you need to look for. Like if Kirby Seed comes in, does he can like make adjustments based around his first outing? Like that's what you need to look at. Like can Coar continue to go scoreless? Like that's what we need to be looking for, not like individual outings. It's looking at like, do you guys look like they're on time with their swings? Do like, for example, when when you see Dominic Canzone hit that ball off the fence in right field, that's great. I, like you said, it's it's the fact that it was off of a lefty, it was off of a breaking ball. That's what matters because you're looking to see if they hit if they made the adjustment. It, it also it's so hard because you can have guys like Peyton Alford coming up from high A. And, and sure, the White Sox won because a guy from high A walked three guys in a row. Who cares? Spring training stats don't matter. It's about the process. It's about how guys are looking. It's about making sure that they are making the plays they need to be making while getting comfortable at the plate or out on the mound. Otherwise, I don't care if Julio goes 0 for 50 in spring training. Does he look good out there? I mean, does he look at, good doing going over 50? It'd be tough. Don't get me wrong. If Julio goes over 50, I'm going to be a little, a little worried. Mm -hmm. Just a bit because more than likely he's facing some like single A pitchers. But in the end, these games do not matter. These stats do not matter. But you know what does matter, Joe? Uh, this video on the screen right now. That video on the screen right now. Go ahead and check that one out next. We appreciate you guys watching episode 64 of the Hit It Here podcast presented by Bet Online, the Mike Morin episode of the Hit It Here podcast, and go Mariners.